Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in work and in life and simplify them. And friends, we're doing a whole series breaking down the way we work. And you know, I like getting back to basics. And this is a thing that should be universal within any organization, whether you are an organization of one person or 100,000 people around the world. Do you know what your vision, your mission and your core values are at work? And how do you drive them? Let's break it down. Let's simplify it today. My special guest, his name is Andrew Stout, and he's the host of the Let's Be Diverse podcast, which is an HR podcast where he shares motivational posts, insights on HR and leadership topics, and also a few personal antidotes. As an empathetic and innovative HR professional, his goal is to inspire like-minded individuals who believe that the workspace should be a safe place to succeed and grow together. So I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, Andrew Stout. Hey, Andrew. Well, hello. Thank you so much for having me on today. I am so pleased you're here, and I love when we simplify what I consider the simple topics because, let's face it, (laughs) they're very rarely simple, right? (laughs) They sometimes aren't, for sure. No, and have you ever worked at a company where uh, they had no clue what their vision, mission, or core values were? That was never relayed to you in an onboarding. It's certainly not something that's that's given to the frontline employees. Have you ever been in that situation before? I, sh- I sure have. Yeah, and I've also been in companies where they're like, "Oh yeah, we should we should do that." We just, oh god, we're so busy. We've never really written anything down. Like, how important is it really? <laughs> I, I think it's very important, and I know that you know it's very important as well. So we're going to break it down in very very practical ways. Um, so first things first, I would love for you to define what each of these are for the modern workplace. So let's talk about a vision statement, a mission statement and core values or operating values. Take it away. So a mission statement is, I would say, what your your mission is, what your direction is of your company. Your vision is what you would like to see in your company. And you said this this mission, vision, and the third one, sorry, was... And core values, of course. Well, core values is... um, something very simple so like for example my core value is rapport building so <clears throat> those are three very valuable things that i believe that a company should have uh and should absolutely believe in but not just writing them down somewhere that yes. they should absolutely believe in every single thing regarding any one of those three Yeah, I think your mission is your purpose. Why does this business exist in the first place? Who Mm -hmm. do you serve? And Mm -hmm. what is that undeniable thing, whether it's your purpose or serving people or serving the planet? Why does this company exist? um, And how does it make a positive impact on the world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and then visions like the aspirational, where do you want to head? We want to serve uh, 1 million women by the year 2027 on the Simplifiers podcast. It's a way for us to quantify how many downloads, how many people um, you know speak we speak to from stage. And it's a big, scary, uh, you know, hairy, audacious goal, right? Um, but I think vision is like, where are you headed next, right? Mm-hmm. For sure. And then core values or operating values. And this is the one I really want you and I to deep dive in because I know you feel very passionate about this. Yeah. In my opinion, it's like, it's the operating system. It's it's how you make decisions uh, in your organization. And, you know, whether a core value is integrity or, um, you know, uh, be open to failure and learning from it, whatever it might be, co-prosperity. It's the things that you as a company, as a full organization, agree that this is what we as a company stand for and, and how we decide to do stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I definitely, you mentioned integrity. I definitely think that honesty fits in there too and trust and respect. Um, You and I talked uh, earlier this week about that and I feel like that is something that is super important, um, not just for leadership, but for the employees on the team. And I feel like if it's not, uh, it doesn't go, it's got to go hand in hand on both sides. So I believe that that's a value that both 
the uh, team members, the, the employees and the leader should should have for sure. So then why is it important in your mind for an organization to teach their workforce about these three elements and specifically their core values? Well, because you want them to run and go efficiently as possible. And we want them to believe in what the process is of the company. And we want them to believe in the company growing and what direction the company is going in. So if they don't believe in that, well, then there's a big culture problem for sure. And that'll just cause many difficult uh, difficulties in, in the organization for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I can imagine just in an example, say you work in a retail um, uh, outlet, you know, and you've got the frontline workers at your retail stores, but you've got corporate, you know, in the support center and they've got big lofty ideas and they're going to raise their prices 30 percent. And the front line's going, what? That's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing that? And if it's not been thoroughly communicated, guess what? The front line that are your salespeople are going to affect your bottom line. It's a cyclical path that everyone needs to know why we do what we do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's an understanding of, again, what direction the company is going in. And like you said, if there's a, a change in pricing, uh, you don't want your employees to be saying, oh, well, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, to the customer saying, I agree with you. These prices shouldn't be where they're at. You want them to be able to explain to the customer why the pricing is where it's at, why they needed to do it, and why it was necessary. Yeah. And I think the customer will understand that rather than just giving them a, a rigmarole uh, answer, something mm-hmm. that doesn't make any sense. They're just going to go home and they go, they know that employee didn't know what they were talking about. They just gave me uh, an answer and just what mm-hmm. they top out, they thought of on the top of their head. And it just didn't, doesn't work for them. But when they hear something structured, then they know, okay, well, this is a professional organization. They know what they're doing and they value not just what they're doing, but they value us as a customer. So mm-hmm. that's super important. Yeah. And I think about values in that way as well Is like, how do you drive value, show the benefits of the products and services that you are offering? Why is it this cost? It's because of this, this, and this, because it provides this solution, this solution, that solution as well, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For sure. So driving into values, um, I was actually um, I, I invited to go to someone else's company picnic recently, and uh, the C-suite uh, came up on on stage, and they they did this wonderful little thing, and they said, "Thank you guys so much." It's all their employees on staff. Um, Thank you guys so much for coming out. Gosh, we are such a family here at this organization. And I couldn't help but sit there and go, ooh, I hate it when people say that in a company, no matter how big or small and no matter how lovely your organization and how it does feel like a family. When companies say that they are a, quote, family, why is that not necessarily a good thing from a values Mm. point of view? Well, not everybody gets along with their family. So when you say that you're a family oriented organization or business, that kind of steers uh, people away. So you mentioned that you went to a, a conference. I speak to a lot of uh, recruiters and that's what they're trying to get organizations to steer away from and start using better words like safe work environment. That's yeah. something that you would want to hear when you hear family, uh, you know, Lots of people do get along with their family, but there's a lot that don't. Uh, and maybe it's one person in the family, maybe it's everybody in the family. So what they, you know, they'll say, Well, I don't get along with my family. Why would I want to go to that organization that's saying they're right. family oriented? They my family doesn't treat me well. So who's to say that they're not gonna treat me the way that I deserve to be treated as an employee? Well, and also family members don't lay off other family members. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that's the exactly. that's the kicker for me, you know. Right. Exactly. I mean, unless you own a stake in a family-run business and you are a, a company of three and you're all like brothers and sisters or or it's a right. father and, and daughter <laughs> business, I don't know of any um family that lays people off uh in, in the family sense, but in the work sense happens all the time. And I really like this idea of a safe working environment. What does that mean to you? So that means, so 
a, a safe work environment for me would be getting up in the morning, Mary, and saying, mm-hmm. oh, wow. So going to bed on a Sunday night and waking up a Monday morning and saying, let's get going here. I get to do this today. I get to go to that meeting yeah. today. I get to work with Susie on that project. I get to do this. This is the words that are important to me. I get to rather than, oh my God, I really don't want to go in there today. I yeah. really don't want to have to deal with so-and-so. I really don't want to have to work on that project. I really don't want to go into that meeting. I really don't want to meet my boss today because I know what's going to happen. You, yeah. It's me. The words are I get to is, and that is a safe work environment to me is saying I get to do something, which means that you're excited to do that. And who want to do, who doesn't want to be excited? A thousand percent. And, and what I hear under what you're saying, I, I mean, this is really at the heart of employee engagement. Why are some people really engaged and plugged in with the work that they're doing? And why are some not? And and Mm -hmm. I think that what we're trying to get at is we're not talking pizza parties and happy hours because those are, yes, a part of an employee Mm -hmm. engagement strategy. It's like the outer layers of the onion. But what's Mm -hmm. at the real core inside is understanding how and why your workers are engaged to right. the work that they do and to the role that they're in. Yep. I talk a lot about like, you know, getting on the bus, right? Uh, and having the path, <laughs> your bus is going down a path and you're headed towards a direction. That direction is your mission and vision, right? Right. The core values is how you drive the bus. Um, are you using energy efficient fuel? Um, right. <laughs> is it a gas guzzler? <laughs> All of it. Exactly. And then there's also sort of the element of having the right people in the right seats on the bus because yeah. you could have brilliant talent, but they're in the wrong department or the yeah. wrong wrong job entirely. And, and that right. might be at the core of why they're disengaged or, or you know, having mm-hmm. that Sunday dread like you talked about, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you want them to, you know, you want them to be, you know, thinking like, sort of, for example, when you are you know, meaning, let's say with your boss and you're saying now your boss or you're behind on a project, Yeah. you know, a a safe work environment would be, Hey, Andrew, how is everything going? Um, And you tell your boss, well, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm really behind. I got lots of stuff going on. I got extra stuff coming at me and a safe work environment would be your boss saying, okay, I'll tell you what it's Wednesday, you know, keep going let you know and then let me know we'll meet again on friday morning and we're gonna see where you are at and if we see that you are still struggling on friday morning after lunch we'll get some you know i'll get some people to give you a hand and see how you know and see if they can help you out so that we go into the weekend um you go into the weekend feeling good about everything and you're not worried about coming in on Monday. So that would be something that would be a safe work environment for me because that would show um, care, compassion for your employee and making sure that uh, they're able to get through um, their tasks and helping them out if need be. I love that. And and you know what? I It just made me think while you're saying all that. Um, that kind of a people eater, in my mind, is an empowering one, uh, yeah. one that is leaning more into coaching. <clears throat> um, hey, I see you're slipping. How can I help? What hurdles or roadblocks can I remove for you? Yeah. Um, do you need more support? You know, rather yeah. than uh, a disciplinarian one like Andrew, you've fallen behind. I'm going to write you up if you don't figure your stuff out really quick, right? Those are two very different tones of voice. Absolutely. And they're very different um, work environments. Um, There's also, back to your point at the top of the hour, like a point of respect. We're we're adults, you know? I'd much rather work for a person who is empowering and saying, hey, I I noticed this. What do you need? I want to support you versus Mm -hmm. I noticed this and you better get it figured out fast, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. I have a friend of mine who's in sales and, uh, you know, most sales jobs at the end of the month, the the manager will come to them and they'll say in most places, you know, in their like, hey, you know, there's three days in a month. 
this is, you know, this is where you're at. This is where you need to be. Um, you know, you need to get there, what have you. So this particular friend of mine, she is a, the manager of uh, her department in mm-hmm. sales. And she doesn't pressure them to say, listen, because she said to me, she says, they know they're at, you just mentioned respect. They know what their goals are. They yeah. know where they need to be at the end of the month. The last thing that they need to be told is, you're short, uh, you know, there's three days left and you're short on your mark. What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. They, that's all the, I mean, they don't need any more pressure on them. They just need to be, they need to be um, told or just, they need to be put in a setting where they're like, listen, I know you can get there. Let's continue to to talk. Come see me at lunchtime. But as long as there's open communication, then yeah. That person's gonna feel so safe that they're gonna pretty much. I like to say it all the time and joke around, but they'll pretty much want to run through a wall for this person because they're, you know, they they see that they're that person is looking after them, that they care about them, not just the goal, but them yeah. as an individual. And again, I think all of this points back if you peel the onion back, 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 back to the core values of the company. How do we operate this business? Um, And are we collaborative? Are we um, empathetic? Are we here to support one another? Uh, I think that that, that's at the core. And so this is part of kind of that training for not only your people leaders, but enterprise-wide. Every single person that works for a company needs to understand um, values in in that sense. Because sadly, I feel like a lot of people leaders, and maybe I'm speaking from in general terms here, but a lot of people leaders that I come across maybe never got formal training or education on how to be a great people leader, how to right. be a coach. They're, they've come from maybe a space where they had a crappy boss who had a crappy right. boss and it all just sort of trickles down from one to another and goes, oh, well, disciplinary and autocratic, isn't that how all bosses are? I guess mm-hmm. I have to be this big, tough person right. um, who is not very respectful either, right? right? Absolutely. And, you know, but I mean, as far as that goes, um, I truly believe that when somebody is put into that position uh, where you're, so let's say, Mary, you are working and your manager comes to see you and says, hey, Mary, you do a great job. We love your work ethic. We want you to become a people leader. We want you to lead this department. So you say, sure. So the proper way, so most people, like you say, will take the position it's a higher salary, so they'll take the extra money, and yeah. they and 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 they'll and they'll they'll just take it and they'll do it. So the right thing for me, as as far as that goes, would be the person taking the job as a manager, taking responsibility and speaking to the heads and say, "Listen, I would love to take this position. I don't have a lot of formal training on managing." Uh, but I do want to learn, um, are you going to be offering some training for me? And then it's the managers on that turn who are making sure that when they put somebody in there to say, hey, listen, we know, understand, Mary, that you haven't had a lot of training in that, in management. We're going to work with you. You're going to do the job. But for the next six months, we're going to have somebody working with you, training with you, because we understand that dealing with people and learning how to talk to people and being a people leader is different from you doing your job. So I think it's a responsibility of both. I think if if one doesn't do that and the other one does their part, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit the culture and it doesn't align with what the company is looking to do. Both parties, I think, have to take the full responsibility of making sure that the job is going to be done properly as a manager. Yeah, I love that. And and I really am I'm glad that you said that because it, it is both parties' responsibility. And, and, you know, I think sometimes people feel a little bit nervous speaking up, um, you know, especially if you're given an opportunity to go from an individual contributor or a frontline mm-hmm. worker to managing people. Um, y- some people might go, oh, I don't want to 
reveal that I've never done this before. And they go, oh, do you want the job? And they go, yes, of course, I can do that. Great. Uh, and then just sort of bumble their way through it. I think that there's something to having the emotional intelligence and vulnerability to go, you know what? I'd love some extra support and training on how our company does people management and, yep. and spin it in that way. So, right. you know, you're asking for it, you're advocating for what you need in order to be really good at that aspect right. of uh, your job. Right. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be some formal education, especially if you work for a small business. Mm -hmm. um, it could just be having a mentor that's, right. you know, you connect with biweekly or once a month who shares some insights on how they've been a great people leader and, right. and can ripple down to you, right? right? Absolutely. I feel like when the, the, the soonest moment, Mary, that we say that we know it all or we're good, yeah. That's when we get ourselves in trouble. So you and I were both podcasters. We're both HR people, but we're both podcasters. Uh, I say for myself as a, as a leader, I'm I'm always learning. I will continue to learn. As a podcaster, I continue to learn, and as an HR person, I continue to learn because yeah. there's things are changing all the time. And the moment that I say that I know everything, that's when I'm going to find myself in deep trouble. A hundred percent. And I think that the way of work is changing right now rapidly um, because of AI and artificial intelligence and automation. But that's another podcast for another time. Um, for sure. So talking about like driving your values, driving your mission and vision at work, um, really not just putting it on a, a poster on the wall, but actually every single day. You know, you and I talked offline and sadly, people make assumptions about others that they work with all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can people leaders be a great role model to value each other, our diverse opinions and backgrounds and start to reverse this behavior if it's happening at their work? Well, when we talked about core values before. One of my core values is rapport building. So I feel like it comes to rapport building right off the bat. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of rapport building, Mary. So could be you could be walking to a meeting, you could cross paths with me and you can say, Hey, Andrew, how's everything going? How are you doing? How's the work? How's the workload? But you're walking to your meeting, you're late for your meeting, and you yeah. got to get to your meeting. So there's two things that you can do that is going to make me feel good. You can, can, you can say, hey, how are you doing? Good. Uh, oh, it's going okay. And you could continue walking and leave it at that. Or, or you could say, Andrew, um, listen, I, I really want to continue this discussion, uh, but I'm just on my way to a meeting. Why don't we continue this? Uh, I'll be back at my, my desk around 11 o'clock. Why don't you come see me in my office and let's continue this discussion because I really want to see how uh, you're doing. It's very important to me to find out how things are going for you, especially on that project. So right away, that the two different ways changes everything, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It changes the focus from me my focus, I got to get to this meeting, I got to do my thing, right? To we, right? So like, I, I see you. I, it's eye contact. Yep. It's, um, gosh, it's like the basics in, in human connection. And I dare say etiquette, because yep. it's also the same if, if you're in a meeting with me and I'm presenting on a topic, if you're sitting away, tip tapping at your computer and sending off emails and, you know, completely distracted, what message does that give me? <laughs> it doesn't it's, give you a very good message. Doesn't make me feel very warm and fuzzy about you at no. all. No. No. <laughs> it, no. it makes me go, what, oh, obviously what I'm saying is not as important as what you're doing there. Um, and I think people forget that. Like genuinely, I have a lot of empathy for this. I think people you know, are so overloaded with work and so underwater that they yeah. feel like they have to be multitasking at all times. Yeah. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is this stuff, human connection is how you build rapport, right? It's how Thanks. you build trust and respect. Tell it me more. It certainly is. I feel like when people are looking, especially for candidates or looking for new employment or going for jobs, yes, we want to get good salary. We need to get 
money. We need to pay our bills. We need to put food on the table. If we have children, we need to put, you know, get clothes on their backs and get their, you know, stuff that they need for school. So we do need a good salary. However, mm-hmm. what I what I feel like a candidate and what people are looking for tremendously these days is to be seen, heard, valued, and understood. And you yeah. said it before, once they see that, they can, you can, they'll do whatever is needed to, uh, as far as the work goes and far as workload goes, and because they are, they know that they're being under, you know, they're, they're being understood and, and valued by their, by their employer. So those are four important things that I feel that people are looking for first and foremost. And if they don't see that right away, they may even be getting an offer from, or they might be walking out of an interview and saying, if I get an offer from this place, I'm probably not going to take it because I just don't feel that vibe. Mm. And that there is something very intuitive about that. And I'm so glad that you brought that up uh, at the interview level because recruiters out there, again, a lot of empathy, a lot of recruiters right now are overloaded because uh, quite a few of their peers got cut last year. And so they're doing the same volume will work, but having to do it with less people, I get it. But there is that human element. Um, and, sure. and I think that what comes down to it is, is almost emotional intelligence, isn't it? You know, and this kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier about people making assumptions about other people. When we forget how to be human <laughs> with each other, it, it, this is where it all starts to fall apart. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right? Being absolutely. seen, heard, valued, and understood, you would hope is a basic <sighs> human, like, uh, necessity and, and action, but sadly, it's not always the case in an office environment, is it? I, I no, it's not. And we're talking about assumption. I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and we're talking about assuming and years ago, I was telling them a story years ago, I was working in a retail store and I had a coworker who just had it. He did not, he had enough of the place. He couldn't handle it anymore. He had his work shirt and he had another shirt underneath his work shirt. He took his shirt off, threw it on the counter and said, that's it. I'm out of here. And he walked off. And the boss came out and said, hey, uh, where's uh, so-and-so? And And somebody else on our team said, oh, he just wasn't happy anymore and decided to leave. Mm. So that was an assumption, right? Now... Today, because of the talks of everything, of the quiet quittings, and now there's like the talks mm-hmm. of the loud quittings, <laughs> that stuff happened years ago, but nobody was talking about it before, Mary. Now they're, they've given it a title or they've given it something. Yeah. So now we don't assume. So why did that, you know, why did that person leave? Well, you're all going to assume, oh, we didn't get the position that they wanted or they're not happy or they don't like their boss or whatever. But we don't know what it is. It could have been any reason why they decided to leave. But we should never assume what person, what someone's thinking, what they're going through and and what what is important to them in order to, you know, whether it has to do with their career, whether they decide that where they're at is good for their career or whether Mm. they need to move forward. We have no idea. So we should never assume what somebody is going through or why they're deciding to leave uh, an organization. Yeah. And I think most adults are not impulsive. They they don't make a decision one day to rip off their shirt and walk out of their their job, right? Absolutely it's not. those slow micro moments that yeah. add yeah. up that go, oh, that person was really not respectful to me today. Oh, that that boss was horrible um, yeah. and didn't give me any support or feedback. Oh, I did not like how this happened. Blah 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 yeah. blah blah. They just sort of mount on each other, and I think most people nine times out of 10 are never doing it on a one shot impulse moment. Right. No, no, no. it's no. well, it's well thought out. Um, and it's usually, it's almost like anything. I mean, when, you know, and it just happened that maybe that day they just, you know, it could have been anything else that, mm-hmm. but 
that it, situation just triggered something and they just couldn't take it um, anymore. I mean, you know, I mean, it could be a situation where they, you know, another situation where somebody, you know, they having a rough time for, the, you know, three months. And then one day they go into work and they get a, an email with um, uh, everything written in red and, mm-hmm. uh, and in caps. Mm-hmm. So you don't know what that person read because they're not going to, you know, they probably didn't say it. So you just never know. So why should we assume why they left? If Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also I, I it makes me think, um, especially if you haven't had this as a role model yourself, it, it's hard to begin a new behavior. Um, but as a people leader, you know, I, I would always want to uh, look for the other signs of what's going on underneath. Again, root cause. Um, <laughs> and you just never know what's going on outside of work hours either. And while that is not your responsibility, let me be very clear as a people leader, what other people's personal lives are not necessarily your responsibility whatsoever. There is a level for empathy um, and and not to be so quick to call a PIP, like a performance improvement plan. And all of of a sudden we have to document everything and and you're going to be on a disciplinary track or you're out of here, buddy. Um, It's a, hey, I noticed something's different. Um, Do you want to talk about it? Or even back to your example earlier, I I, want to make sure I mention this. Uh, My last organization, they had a, um, it was built in a, 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 Oh, and so you could rock a lap, you know, and I just love doing that. So if I noticed you, Andrew, and having, you know, kind of body language that's a little shut down or, or or looking very stressed, I'd be like, hey, Andrew, let's take a lap together. Let's walk and talk, you right. know, right. because one lap, I could probably solve a lot in about 10 minutes, you know, or, or at least help, you know, listen and, and create that safe space for you to, um, you know, vent or let it out or ask for advice or otherwise. But- I think that that people leaders, we, we have a responsibility to um, understand the full picture before assuming or, or making a snap judgment of like, wow, he's just not a very good worker, um, mm-hmm. and we need to we need to document this and, and roll it out, right? I see this a lot. Um, we need to, as leaders, we need to figure out when we need when we're listening to give feedback and yes. when we're listening with what I call with pause. We're In other words, we're we are listening, but we're not needing or we don't need to give any feedback or feedback is not necessarily or the person's not looking for feedback. They're just looking for somebody to listen. But as a leader, we need to figure out which one is it and make sure that we're doing the correct one at the at the correct time. And the flip side, I'm so glad that you said that. And the flip side is if your worker is continuously showing up 30 minutes late or the till at the retail shop is is coming up short every single time they're in charge, that is a whole other issue. That is a, I noticed this, um, our values here at the company is this. Um, help me understand what's going on here. And then, you know, you create check-in points. Okay, we're, I need you to be here at, at the office at 9 a.m. every morning. Um, we're going to check in on this date if it's not better, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's a different conversation than what we're talking about today, right? Oh, oh, for sure. And understanding, I think, where they're going. So in other words, you know, talking to them, finding out what's happening. So if it's the till short, why is the till short? Is yeah. there something that you're missing? Uh, I know we did some training on this when you first started. Was there something that you didn't understand? Do we yeah. need to go back to the training again? Do we need to show you how to do it again? Asking questions to find out what is what is wrong yeah. um, and why it's and why it's happening, right? Maybe they're doing something that they, you know, again, we're going to use this assumption word. Maybe they got the training, but they assume that this is the right way to do it, but then they didn't realize that they're not doing it the correct way, but communicating is, is always the key. A thousand percent. All right. Now I want to shift gears uh, a little bit and, and put our HR hats on um, for a second. Now, what, what if you notice your senior leadership are not upholding the values of the company in the key decisions that they make? How can you influence and hopefully course correct that as their HR, say, executive advisor? 
What would you say there? Well, I guess you have, you have to have a conversation and you have to find out because maybe there's something, again, maybe there's something we don't want to assume. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe they're not happy. Maybe they're quiet quitting and they're just slowly making their way out of the organization. They're looking for something behind the scenes. We don't know, but we mm-hmm. need to find. So I'd say that what I would do is have a conversation with them and find out exactly, try and see if I can find out exactly what's happening. Yeah. Um, where's, you know, what's going on. I think that would be if the conversation part is, is key, um, you know, and, and finding out exactly once you found out what it is, then now would probably be the next step would be figuring out a solution to it, but we can't figure it out until we have that conversation and know exactly what's going on. For sure. And so let me put an example to this. Let's say um, your senior leadership, your C-suite have now announced that they're freezing all travel budgets for the rest of the year. Um, And they're really tightening down on operating expenses. And you're sitting there thinking, wait a second, one of our core values as a company is co-prosperity, you know, innovating and innovating requires money, R&D money to make it go. What's up? That's a place where I think if I was in that room and that announcement was made and I was not expecting it, um, I would not ask it in a public forum. I'd probably Mm -hmm. pull that executive aside after the meeting and go, hey, just can I have five minutes? Can you explain to me the why behind that decision? Um, Again, a walk and talk is very powerful because you sit down with a person in a meeting, it feels very formal. But just can you tell me a little bit, help me understand the yep. the why behind that decision. And then they're, you know, able to open up. But then again, on the other side of the spectrum, if you notice that your senior leadership are utilizing funds in a unethical way, that is a whole other conversation, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, and if you witness something, uh, it is your responsibility, in my opinion, to talk to your HR professionals about this. Hey, I noticed this. That doesn't live up to what I know is true for our company values. Um, HR is always a safe space to to share that in a confidential way um, if you feel like it's a serious situation, right? Yeah. I mean, HR is is the best place to go. They're the ones that would be the ones to talk to for any particular situation like that. And they're the ones that are going to... uh, have a solution for it. So I definitely would go directly to them and, and explain to them what I feel or what I see and, and, and ask them, you know, I'd be looking for a solution or I would, you know, either that they, you know, they're going to fix it. Or I would ask them, you know, what would you, what would you suggest that I do in this situation? Or how would you suggest that I handle this? Or if I'm going to have a convert, you know, if I'm going to have this conversation, what, do you suggest that I say to them in the conversation so that you're not having a, you don't want to have a combative. um, I always say uh, when I'm asking somebody something to say, you know, I'm asking you a question, can I ask you something? And uh, before I say it, I go curious, but not combative. What is the, what is the, you know, what is your thought on this? Because before you say that, before you ask the question, you don't want it to be like a power struggle right away. But as soon as I say that, they know that, okay, he's not coming at me. He just wants to know what's going on. So yep. right away, it changes the di- the dynamic right away. I appreciate that. That's a great quick little thing to say to set the tone um, so that when people are approached with feedback that may feel um, uh, like uh, aggressive, that that tones that down and goes, you know, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, curious, not combative. I'm going to try that this next week. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject that into a conversation and see how it goes. You, you should. Guys, it works. It works for, it's worked for me every time. So I love it. I really do. Um, and if you're looking for other tips like that, uh, specifically on HR or leadership topics, I highly recommend checking out Andrew's podcast, Let's Be Diverse podcast. Um, and by the way, all the links are in the show notes over at thesimplifiers.com. So you can link up to his his LinkedIn, as well as the podcast uh, website. So you can tune in and and learn more. These are the little things that make us Mm. better, make us better Mm. people leaders and just make us better humans all around. So 
Andrew, as we wrap up, um, these are questions that I like to ask everyone that's on the podcast. So here we go. Fire away. My sure. first question for you is this. Tell me what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system? So the book that I, I actually I have not been a, a big book reader, but in 2024, um, I decided that I was going to start to read some books. So mm-hmm. I started to, I did read the book called uh, A Complete, The Complete Man by Pradeep Sasha. Um, mm. And it's such a great book. Um, it uh, Reading it, um, it helps you to not just to develop as a leader, but also develop as a, as a human, as a man. Um, and it looks at all different aspects of a, of a man's life. So I really um, enjoy that book. Um, as far as, um, tools and stuff like that. I mean, you mentioned that I have my own podcast. I am an avid podcast listener. So I will listen to anybody and everybody's podcast. Um, and this is what I did when I first started, because I feel like you always take something away from each one that you listen to. And I take away each something from each one that I do. And I take one from each one that I guest on. And it's it's so it's super cool to to listen to these conversations and 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 understand what people are are, are thinking and um and what I take away from it is not necessarily that that person is fully right. Uh, what I take away from it is my thought process is diversity of thought. Yeah, my thinking is this way. Their thinking is this way. It doesn't mean that my thinking is the correct way or theirs is the, the correct way. It just means that they're thinking of it a little bit differently than I do. That's yeah. that's quite simply what it is. That's so true. We'll link up that book in the show notes for people if you guys are curious and want to check that out. Again, the simplifiers.com. So Andrew, tell me who is one person, somebody that you know personally in your network that you just feel is up to brilliant things. If we could shine a spotlight on them and who knows, maybe one day we'll have them on the podcast. Um, well, the one, one person that I would say is Amy Michaels. Um, this individual is, she's such a great storyteller and she's such a great speaker. Um, we talked about values today. She has tremendous values. Uh, she is caring, compassionate. Um, she just has, I, I think she has the it factor as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I just, I follow her, uh, everything that she does, um, especially on LinkedIn. Uh, any posts that she makes, I read everything that she, uh, she puts out there. Because for me, she's a tremendous individual. Love it. We will link her up in the show notes if you guys are curious about what she's doing out in the world as well. So I believe gratitude and simplicity go hand in hand. Tell me, what are you grateful for today? So today I'm grateful for, I'm going to say my wife. My wife is actually one of my biggest uh, cheerleaders. She has been the biggest cheerleader since I've started doing what I'm, what I'm doing and what I'm setting out to do. And I'm going to say I'm um, also grateful for um, <clears throat> my parents who are no longer with us, um, but they did teach me a tremendous amount um, and uh, they've taught me how to be humble and genuine. And it's something that I cherish uh, as I get older and continue to uh, to progress with the things that I'm looking to do. Mm, I love that. And I'm so grateful for our time together today as well. I think this is a great conversation. Mm. So again, you can find Andrew through our show notes at thesimplifiers.com. That's where you can hear his podcasts as well. You can click through. Now, someone somewhere is listening to you and I right now, and they're feeling super uh, unengaged, uh, absolutely at work. They they are on the verge of ripping their shirt off and throwing it down and going, oh, forget this place. Their values are so detached from what I believe is right and true. What's one thing you could whisper into their ear right now just to help them pause and feel encouraged? I would say to understand your values, uh, understand how important they are, and be genuine about it. Andrew, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me.